Somalia. When it comes to war-torn conflict zones, brutal civil wars, and failed states, this is one particular country that's likely to be near the top of just about everybody's lists. Between the de facto independent government in the northern Somaliland region, the autonomous state of Puntland at Somalia's outermost tip, the fragile and often fiery Somali government, and the continued resurgence of the simultaneously Somali ethno-nationalist and jihadist terror group Al-Shabaab, Somalia is among the world's most profoundly broken nations, and one that seems to be very, very far away from ever finding its footing as a coherent sovereign state. But among the carnage and the chaos, one group of elite special operators stands out. And not a group on loan from the US, Europe, Russia, China, or anywhere else on Earth, but one made up of Somalis and directly loyal to the Somali National Army. They're called the Dinar Brigade, and they're armed with the best weapons foreign aid can buy, a distinctive sky blue beret, and a wealth of knowledge taken direct from the mouths of American nations. Navy SEALs. They're an enigmatic and deadly force at work all across the deserts of Somalia. And in today's installment of our Special Operators series, we're going to be taking a closer look at this fascinating military unit, how they came to be, how they do their work, and just how long they have left in a state that not even they can keep from spiraling towards total collapse. The history of the Dinar Brigade cannot be understood without context, and specifically without a clear understanding of just what sort of hell Somalia has been going through over the last half century. While Somalia hasn't known much peace at all since it first gained its independence in 1950, the really difficult years began in 1969, when one Mohamed Syed Barre rose to power in a coup after the nation's prior president was assassinated. Through famine, and mass starvation in the 1970s and war with Ethiopia and its Cuban allies through the 1980s, Somalia narrowly survived the Bari years. But when he was overthrown in 1991, the entire nation descended into chaos. For the following several years, Somalia would know perpetual civil war between a wide range of warlord and militia factions, with a US-led intervention trying and failing to put an end to the violence. Even after the Somali government technically did consolidate, that war has only continued, with intermittent flares in the bloodshed proving more than enough to keep the entire fractured nation on a knife's edge. But since the mid-2000s, no armed group in Somalia has been quite so devastating as the Al-Shabaab organization. With a name that literally translates to the youth and a history tracing back to popular guerrilla resistance against an Ethiopian invasion of Somalia in late 2006, the group rapidly radicalized through the late 2000s and picked up widespread support as a popular insurgent movement. An Islamist and fiercely Somali nationalist group, Al-Shabaab claims to represent the interests of the entire Somali diaspora, even outside Somalia's own borders, and it aspires to create a new, larger Somali state under Islamic law spanning across the African Horn. The group declared allegiance to Al-Qaeda in 2012 and has long relied on suicide attacks and brutal violence to fight against the Somali government. It's known for its harsh imposition of Sharia law on the areas of Somalia that it controls, and for its continued resilience against counterattacks by the Somali government, even when the government is supported directly by foreign powers. Al-Shabaab is present all over Somalia, holding significant territory in the south and maintaining bases even in Somaliland and Puntland, where the government in Mogadishu wields next to no power. Against Al-Shabaab's rising tide, international onlookers watching Somalia understood that something more was necessary if the nation's fragile government was going to prevent a complete Al-Shabaab takeover sooner or later. The solution came by way of the United States, which was at the time still deeply embroiled in Afghanistan, trying to cope with the Syrian civil war and the broader repercussions of the Arab Spring, and working overtime to create any points of stabilization they possibly could as bulwarks in the evolving war on terror. In Somalia, America's vision was ambitious, but precise in terms of what exactly Mogadishu would need if it was going to prevent Somalia from getting any worse. And we should mention here that that America's choice to support the Somali central government was much more one of urgent need than choice. We're not going to get into the inner workings and highly questionable activities of the Somali government in this particular video, but suffice to say there's plenty to talk about. But backing that regime was better than kicking off a whole new round of large-scale civil war. And in order to try and ensure Mogadishu's survival, America was going to give them a weapon, a highly trained group of loyal Somalis who were capable of standing up to Al-Shabaab in a direct firefight and then coming out on top. 
The group would have to be able to include members of many Somali clans, not just one, and its members would have to be willing to work together in service to the Somali state, not to their own clan leaders. They would have to be very well trained to stand up to al-Shabaab militants who were, at that time, the most fearsome fighters in the country, and they would have to be exceptionally brave in order to hold their ground against fighters with a deservedly terrifying reputation for their brutality in combat. The training and selection processes were to be carried out not by the US military, but by a private military contractor known as Bancroft Global Development. Previously known as Landmine Clearance International, Bancroft has gained a reputation for training hardened units in war-torn nations, although Somalia has since become the group's primary focus. Their trainees were a total of 150 recruits who began the process at Bail Dogal Airfield, about 90 kilometers northwest of Mogadishu in October of 2013. After a six-month training course, the recruits who had made it through Bancroft's training were inaugurated to the first class of commandos. The group was given a name, Danab, meaning lightning, and by the end of 2014, the unit had swelled its ranks to include somewhere around five to 600 commandos in total. The Danab Brigade was born, its mission was urgent, and it wasted absolutely no time in getting to work. In the early days of the Danab Brigade, the Somali military was not a place where the average person wanted to be. At that time, the military was only loosely held together by its few loyal officers and was hardly more of a formidable force than any of the country's patchwork of militias. Its recruits largely came from the poorest of the poor across Somalia, enticed to the military by the opportunity to make a small but non-zero amount of money. When Danab got its start, it brought together the relatively few Somali soldiers who had been willing to distinguish themselves over and above what was expected to earn their pay. But those soldiers have since proved more than capable of surpassing expectations. Non-military recruits are also welcome in Danab and undergo a crash course in basic training as part of their selection. All recruits are scrutinized for physical fitness, political affiliation, and socioeconomic backgrounds, and they have biometric data collected and evaluated to ensure that they've not committed any known human rights violations in the past. Since the early days, Somalia has begun to target more experienced combat veterans for recruitment in Danab, especially as the Somali government has waged a more active counteroffensive against against al-Shabaab and taken some steps to improve the quality of its troops overall. Highly educated Somalis are in particular demand to join the Darb's ranks, further helping to shape perceptions of the unit as some of the best that Somalia has to offer. Women, too, are allowed to qualify for Danab by 2021, and a handful have since joined the group's ranks. Equally important within Danab is the group's emphasis on recruiting from multiple Somali clans in order to avoid the intense factionalism and clan loyalties that permeate all of Somali politics. After all, it would be all too easy for Danab to gain a reputation as a US-backed, highly trained enforcement arm of just one clan, and thus quickly become despised by all the others. Instead, the Nab has recruited from clans representing a range of Somali federal states. In fact, one of the US's eventual goals for the unit is to be able to deploy brigades made up of local troops in each of Somalia's states, making the group into an elite combination of military and police forces trusted by the local population. By weighing a recruit's clan loyalties against their individual merit as a potential soldier, Bancroft and the US have been able to keep the Nab from seeming like an occupying army or an extension of the will of whatever person wields the greatest influence in most Mogadishu on a given day. When a Danab recruit enters the group selection process, they'll face an ordeal deeply inspired by the US Army Rangers, Special Forces Operators, and Navy SEALs who've had a major impact on the unit. Soldiers who make it through the group's hazy selection trials will then receive intense training on both urban and rural warfare, with an emphasis on both carrying out and dealing with the sort of asymmetric warfare that has become so commonplace across Somalia. Unlike other military elements within Somalia, Danab is expected to wage war on al-Shabaab's territory, dealing with the best of the group's fighters and using its own tactics against it. They're also taught how to navigate through the Somali savanna, engage in combat at close quarters, and even conduct raids and even helicopter insertions against enemy camps. Although they initially received nearly all of their training from foreigners, Danab's own commandos are now responsible for handling a majority of the training of new recruits in the 2020s. Those recruits come in batches about 350 at a time, as necessary to replenish and slowly grow the ranks of their unit. By all accounts, the trainees within Danab's ranks have proven more than able to pick up on the hard lessons supplied to them, first by Bancroft and then by the US Navy SEALs and other military advisors. From their start as a small platoon, the group's numbers have since swelled into a full-on brigade, with an estimated unit strength of around 2,000 troops at a given time. The US wants it to be even bigger, eventually reaching the size of three to 4,000. With that increase in size has come an increase in direct involvement from the United States. Now the United States Special Operations Command, Africa's Section, and 
and the United States' Africa Command maintain a direct presence at Bailed Ogle Airfield, sending their own elite instructors to work alongside contractors in training the next generation of Denav troops. The garrison and headquarters at Bald Ogle have been significantly expanded to the point that Denab now runs what is functionally its own command center, coordinating its own activities across Somalia. The Denar Brigade's operations are shrouded in mystery, partly owing to the secret and intense nature of many of their operations, and partly due to the communications blackout that still exists over much of modern Somalia. But we do know that Denar began its work quickly after its first few platoons graduated from training. In 2017, Denar operators were on the ground alongside members of SEAL Team 6 during a raid on a part of the Shabel River called Bari, pursuing an Al-Shabaab leader colloquially known as Mahad Karate. The mission was unsuccessful, and claims the life of a Navy SEAL, Senior Chief Petty Officer Carl Milliken. Two other SEALs were wounded, while none of the accompanying Denab commandos were hit in the firefight. Denab didn't seem to bear the blame for the killed and wounded SEALs after the operation. In fact, it wasn't long afterward that the US began advocating for an expanded version of the brigade. In the following years, Denab launched regular self-run operations against Al-Shabaab across a broad swath of territory in Somalia's central and southern reaches. Frequently, they're joined by U.S. close air support, artillery fire, and joint terminal attack controllers on the ground. Information from the ground is limited, but those American troops do appear to regard the brigade's work positive, as do a detachment of Turkish forces that assists with training some elements of the Denab force. Over the years, Denab's combat medics have gotten markedly more proficient in their work, saving lives and allowing commandos to return to the fight. The commandos have also gotten very good at responding to Al-Shabaab's particular combat approach, including its surprise attacks in the savannah and its use of truck bombs, RPGs, and waves of suicide bombers. Since the start of the 2020s, Denab has been engaged in a broadening offensive against Al-Shabaab across a specific section of Somalia's territory. According to foreign policy, the group has been able to clear roughly 90% of Al-Shabaab targets in that area since mid-2022, and in late 2023, Denab dismantled Al-Shabaab control over three districts in the Somali province of Garmadag. Press materials circulated about the group within the last year have indicated that Denab has led to the liberation of well over 100 towns and villages across Somalia, a figure that would clearly distinguish them as the only group within Somalia that's able to perform operations on that scale. In 2023, the group's latest crop of trainee graduates had their photos circulated among the Western press in a clear sign of just how enthusiastic the United States remains about the success of their ambitious commando project. Denab has taken heavy losses in the fight with Al-Shabaab. That 2023 training class, for example, was rushed across Somalia just after graduation to replenish two battalions that had seen over a hundred commandos killed the month prior. But for the soldiers of Denab, that risk will endure whether they go to the front lines or not. After all, if Al-Shabaab takes over more and more of Somalia, then they'll be in the crosshairs anyway. The group is adept at working jointly with local militias, who are at times the only other meaningful force willing to fight against Al-Shabaab. The rest of the Somali military is woefully corrupt and poorly trained, whereas the militia in the countryside tends to be much more strongly motivated to take part in operations that will protect their homes, their children, and their communities. Denab has been able to stay aloof from the politics of Mogadishu and avoid being used as a pawn in the power struggles there, in part by emphasizing their close relationship with the US and their status as the only real military force that can act as a bulwark against Al-Shabaab. They've also been able to achieve their combat success without the fancy weaponry or even the body armor of most global special operators. With some exceptions, Denab operatives aren't armed with much better than standard AK-47s, and though their stocks of equipment are improving, they're poster boys for the idea of doing more with less. They rely on US intelligence and military advisors to figure out where, when, and why to attack, but by and large, it's Denab on the front lines getting the work done. U.S. operators take part only rarely and are typically not present alongside the group's smaller units as they move across the countryside. Instead, those groups are monitored by drones and reconnaissance aircraft so that American advisors can send backup in case they run into more trouble than they can handle alone. But while the Denar Brigade has been largely successful in its combat operations against Al-Shabaab, the group is often forced to watch helpless as much of its work is undone by the terror group after Denar moves on. 
Fierce as they are, the Dinar Brigade is just that, a brigade of some 2,000 troops, meaning that they do not have the strength by themselves to protect the targets that they seize or hold the territory that they capture. Instead, that's the work of the regular Somali military, and at times, forces set up by the UN to help assist with Somalia's internal crisis. But those regular troops and UN-backed forces are simply not capable of holding out against al-Shabaab in force, or at least not when al-Shabaab really wants something back after it's been taken. Zanab is, by all accounts, the tip of the spear in Somalia, but as sharp and deadly as the tip may be, the rest of the spear happens to be a little more than a twig. Until and unless that changes, Danab's victories will often be fleeting, and the real value to Somalia that they confer won't necessarily be the lasting benefits of a military victory. Instead, it's a matter of propaganda wins and the slow, attritional progress that comes from killing members of Al-Shabaab one by one, up close and personal, a single raid at a time when there are an entire country's worth of raids to carry out. And Danab's standing inside Somalia is nowhere near as firmly entrenched as Danab would like it to be. The problem here is twofold. One, a lack of security inside Somalia, and two, a lack of reliability of American support. In Somalia itself, Danab is empowered by a government in Mogadishu that is managing to survive, but it certainly is not strong. If that government goes away or becomes too weak to exert its influence, Danab risks disintegration, with many of its members forced to either band together and go it alone or head back to their clans. And not only that, but Danab could very easily be co-opted by a strongman within Somalia if such a person were able to gain enough power in Mogadishu to begin exerting unilateral authority over the military. And in terms of American involvement, Danan exists at the mercy of political realities in Washington. A slash of the red pen here, a few angry Democrats or Republicans there, and the entire Danab project could very easily have its US support pulled out from underneath it. That risk runs all the higher, as American involvement across the Middle East ramps up in 2024, creating a situation in which American political and military leaders must call into question whether their resource expenditures in Somalia are really so high on their priority list. But for as long as they do exist, Danab appears to be more than happy to carry on with their work, liberating Somalia kilometer by kilometer from the grasp of an incredibly violent enemy. Following one convoy of about 30 to 40 Danab operators crammed into three pickup trucks, BBC reporter Andrew Harding reported in 2022 that the platoon he was traveling with was motivated to continue the fight against al-Shabaab. Wrote Harding about the group he followed, quote, They are lean, confident men, at ease with their weapons, and used to traveling light. One of the men in the platoon related to Harding a recent operation in which Danab had killed some 60 Al-Shabaab fighters over the course of a day-long battle and pushed several hundred more out of a town called Bukure. It was a battle that reflected the intensity of Danab's adversaries in Al-Shabaab and the degree to which the terrorists are loath to leave any territory behind. In Bukhare, Al-Shabaab destroyed the central water tower and set fire to much of the town on their way out, shooting at civilians in a last-ditch effort to exact vengeance despite their clear inability to stand up to Danab. Equally as stunning as Danab's combat success is the degree to which Harding and the BBC found that civilians were willing to speak out and directly voice their hatred of al-Shabaab now that they were under the protection of the Danab commandos and seemingly sure that al-Shabaab wouldn't dare to come back. And that faith in the unit and their capabilities is perhaps the Danab battalion's greatest achievement across all of Somalia. For the first time in generations, Somalis that have been liberated from al-Shabaab control are able to live in relative confidence that they won't be threatened again. With Danab at work on the ground, civilians have far less to fear from foreign intervention and particularly foreign airstrikes where civilian casualty rates were far higher than they are now. In some ways, Danab is proof of concept that a multi-clan, western-backed, meritocratic organization can exist within Somalia, and although it'll be extraordinarily difficult to get such a system to catch on in larger ways amid Somali's powerful clans, it's not impossible. If Somalia is ever going to chart a real path forward to a better future, it's likely to be Danab that leads the way. If not for them, Mogadishu may well have been overrun by now. But with Danab on the front lines, the country stands a chance at subduing al-Shabaab and pivoting toward the countless other issues Somalia will have to grow through if it's going to become a true nation again. Danab may not be the most vaunted special operators on Earth, or the best equipped, or even the best trained, but they are the tip of the spear in a place where they are desperately needed. Somalia may not survive, even with Danab, but it certainly can't survive without them.